Hey there, and welcome back. We are on element three, sub element C. This one's a fun one, so I have pictures. Why are simplex UHF signals rarely heard beyond the radio horizon? UHF signals are usually not propagated by the ionosphere. And so the ionosphere is part of our Earth's protective layer. And sometimes you, uh, with HF, you can use that ionosphere and the charged ions up there to reflect signals back to Earth. And then, of course, you can bounce them back. And it's, it's really neat and fascinating how we can talk to places sometimes and sometimes you can't. The answer to this one, though, UHF signals are usually not propagated by the ionosphere. They are strictly line of sight. So line of sight is if each person, each antenna could see each other even just a little bit. The radio horizon is that the atmosphere refracts just a little bit. So you actually can go just a little bit further than line of sight with uh, VHF and UHF signals. What is a characteristic of HF communication compared with communication on VHF and higher frequencies? C. Long distance ionospheric propagation is far more common on HF. It's just more common. Question three, what is a characteristic of VHF signals received via auroral backscatter? That's a hard word for me to say. They are distorted and signal strength varies considerably. So if there's an aurora, sometimes VHF signals can be reflected off of them and it scatters the signal. So that's where that si it's distorted. It sounds kind of crackly. Uh, there was a movie, I think it was called Frequency, and that may be the name of the movie, but it sort of played on that right there. It had uh, Dennis Quaid in it. All right, question number four. Which of the following types of propagation is most commonly associated with occasional strong signals on 10, 6, and the 2 meter bands from beyond the radio horizon? And this is called sporadic E. And I've heard of sporadic E. And I went and did a little bit of reading about it. And I still don't quite understand it. There's, there's quite a few theories about what sporadic E really is. But it's called a cloud. And from what I've read, it's a cloud of ions, charged particles. And your transmitter, the waves bounce off of it and come back down to the earth. And then if you get a nice refraction off of it, pew, pew, and it skips off of Earth and hits another one, you can get a pretty good distance off of it. Now, this looks like it's going um, about maybe a, a sixth around the Earth at this point. But that is the sporadic E, and they are just as that. They are sporadic. Now, it's said that the... Uh, during the late summer months is when sporadic E is the most common. Which of the following effects may allow radio signals to travel beyond obstructions between the transmitting and receiving stations? And this is called knife edge diffraction. Now, if you've ever taken a physics class, you can look at knife edge um, by doing waves in the water going around an obstacle or through an obstacle. A knife edge effect, we're over here at uh, this particular website, and you can kind of see from this, this transmitter, this is blocking the signal. But as that signal hits the top edge of it, it refracts it. And you can see that this receiver over here receives it even though there's not a line of sight. And that is knife edge refraction, or diffraction, sorry. Now this is a fun one. What type of propagation is responsible for allowing over the horizon VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis? And this is tropospheric ducting. And this is what got me interested in wanting to be a, in a, a general 
so I could get on HF was when I was on 2 meter FM, I was talking to people 200 miles away on simplex and pulling up repeaters and talking to people even further than that because I was trying to talk on our repeater and it was pulling up other repeaters from hundreds of miles away. And that is from temperature inversions. So tropospheric ducting, that's when, that's, that's what the answer is. What band is best suited for communicating via meteor scatter? So if you have meteors coming through, you could use six meters, which is VHF. It's just at the very low end. And you can bounce that off of the charged particles from a burning meteor. Question number eight. What causes tropospheric ducting? You should know the answer to that. I just said it was temperature inversions in the atmosphere. So a good way to tell is if smoke is rising, you know, smoke is pretty warm, and then it's and then it stops rising and starts collecting. There's usually warmer air above that cooler air, and that's where that tropospheric ducting it starts bouncing those radio waves, and then eventually they exit and come back to Earth, and then somebody picks it up. It's a lot of fun. Alrighty, so question number nine says, what is generally the best time for long distance 10 meter band propagation via the F region? Now the F region, uh, let's go look that up. F region, so we can go ahead and show you in the ionosphere all these regions. We're just going to pick the first picture that comes up so that you can see, watch this not even go to where we want to go. I just want this picture. All right, so you can see the regions. You have the D region is the lowest. The E region is just above that. And then there's two sections of F region during the day. And then there's only one during the night. And the D region is what absorbs some of the 40 meter stuff, uh, 30, 40. It kind of absorbs it during the day because that D region forms. At night, the D region is usually gone by then and fades away and then you get good propagation on those lower frequencies. So you, you're learning a lot about the planet while you're doing this uh, ham test study. So the answer is from dawn to shortly after sunset during periods of high sunspot activity. And as I'm recording this, we are at some of the peak of solar cycle 25, and 10 meters is, is exciting at times. Which of the following bands may provide long distance communications via I, the ionosphere's F region during the peak of the sunspot cycle? Well, here we go. We have 6 and 10 meters. And I've been seeing a lot of 6 and 10 meter activity here lately. I even made my second 6 meter single sideband uh, QSO in all of the 13 years I've been licensed just this weekend uh, as of this recording. Now, of course, by the time this recording comes out, it will have been months. And the last question, and I have a, a funny for this one, and it might offend some people, and I'm sorry if it does. Why is the radio horizon for VHF and UHF signals more distant than the visual horizon? And it is because the atmosphere refracts radio waves slightly. Um, the picture that I have is proof that the earth is not flat. So you have two antennas here on the rounder marble sized earth and those two antennas are not line of sight. They cannot see each other. But if you can get some of that refraction through the uh, sporadic E or something like that, you might be able to bounce it and hit that other antenna. If the earth was flat, we should be able to VHF, UHF each other from anywhere that we could be uh, just short of the ice rings up there. 
And uh, <laughs> so your answer to that question is certainly going to be the atmosphere refracts radio waves slightly. So I hope that this uh, last few minutes has been um, somewhat entertaining. When we return, we're going to start to get into more math and some some science for sure and electronics it's going to be a little bit different and so i'm going to have to discover some ways to be able to draw some of this math out for you there's some formulas so go ahead and get ready because element four five six seven eight nine and zero are sort of a doozy and a little bit different and i want you to be able to understand how to get to the answers instead of just memorizing the answers. Alrighty, so I'm Rob, W1RCP. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time, 73.